is did you see in the Times, in the New York Times today, uh, article that the Canadian Department of Health or something has declared that alcohol is bad for you? <laughs> what? <laughs> so, the but, fuck? Specifically that no amount of alcohol is good for you and no amount of alcohol is not bad for you. And that even one to two drinks a week will have a long-term uh, negative effect on your health. Say no amount is healthy. I'm looking at this right now. Uh, e even like two glasses of wine a week will have a long-term contribution to things like heart disease. And four to five drinks a week will have long-term contributing factors like cancers. And, you know, also like liver function. And this is based... Oh, God, I'm going to have to read this. Yeah. Now, I guess... So, or not, because I don't give a shit and it's not going to change my behavior at all. Breaking news, Jamie. Alcohol is bad for you. Yeah, as though I didn't know. But but now but now the Canadians are saying not just that it's bad for you, but that even in moderation, it's still bad for you. Yeah, there's, well, what about no... my mental health, Canada? Uh, what about that? Oh my God, Jamie. Do I have to hear more about your mental health? I mean, you could stand to hear a little bit more. I, I uh, don't. I actually don't know that I could. Or even more about your own mental health. Uh, I, think I, is the, I am trapped living in my own mental health all the time. Thank you very much. Right. But you could like learn about it. I can't. There's not enough time. I hear about yours so much. <laughs> so much. Don't be dramatic. Hundred and forty thousand deaths per year in the United States. Yep. Yeah. None. None of the like data points here are new. It's just like a major Western power coming out and saying, you know what? Actually, it's all bad. There's no in moderation. It's okay. There's no red wine is good for your heart. It's just bad. It's just like your body knows that it's poison, and you secretly know that it's poison. And now we're actually going to say something about it. Not to mention, like, what, what's the value in coming out and saying this? Uh, I don't know, like, as a public health thing? Right, but is it? I don't know, Jamie. What's the value in putting a Surgeon General's warning on a pack of cigarettes? C cigarettes are different. Cigarettes are a more acute cause of, of health problems, and we know this. Uh, and also, we know that the industry has, like, long lied about the benefits of of smoking oh wait here hang on the, hang on i'm reading yes just announced that the most honest and transparent lobbying industry in the world is the alcohol lobby and that they've never misrepresented the health benefits or not saying that it never has happened the I'm negative saying it effects was of alcohol longer ago you mother you are too close to this to see it seriously What's the benefit of a government coming out and saying that something that people do that's bad for them is actually bad for them? Some th something that has been inexorably linked to culture over millennia. Uh-huh. Like, what's, what's the value here? Uh, I don't know, like progress? <laughs> you know? like <laughs> Sure. I mean, people have been using opium for like hundreds, if not thousands of years. Like there, there, there's value in coming out against opium. Hmm. I don't think that those two things are the same thing, no, Scotty. No, because you don't work in the opium and hospitality industries. Uh, not just because of that, because they are fundamentally different things and you know it. They, they have different effects and they, they are orders of magnitude out of line with one another. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. Give it time, Jamie. That'll be our new slap bet. With, within our lifetimes, do, do we see you know, major restrictions on alcohol distribution and consumption. Absolutely not. As the culture comes to realize that alcohol has a solely negative effect on things. Yeah, because Canada famously uh, leading the charge I'm on progressive saying. issues. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Right, but there is. this is no new data. No. Is the problem. It's, it's just framing the data in a new way. And sometimes there's value to that. And I... Don't think that there is value here, and we're going to move on. That seems reasonable. Damn it. Now I want to read more about this, and we have a podcast to do. That's right. That's right. I fucked your shit up. Oh, you're a Well, you are rude, and that wasn't a nice thing to say. Yeah, well, I don't have that many nice things to say. No, that's not true. I have plenty of nice things to say, Scott. I love you. You're one of my closest friends, and I'm proud to know you. All right. Well, you know what? This, is, this, is, this ties into something I was thinking about leading... 
not not a not a New Year's resolution because I don't normally truck with those, but like a podcast resolution. I was thinking about it about the the ease with which uh, we can slip into characters and personas that are that are negative and and you know very combative uh, uh, friendship dynamics and not difficulty being sincere, but difficulty not being hostile all the time. And I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm going to throw down the gauntlet and let's let's see. Let's see if we can not be dicks to each other for at least the duration of this recording. Well, I mean, that's it's part of the charm I, of, I, of this podcast is like the, the friendly ribbing that we do. We could try and ratchet it back. And I'm down with that. Although I would like to point out that this this gauntlet that you're throwing down comes yeah. right after you deliberately trying to antagonize me. I mean, I was I was trying to get your take on something. <laughs> Let's roll the tape back. And then your take was predictably self-serving and boring. Uh, <laughs> and then I had to antagonize you. S- similarly, I anticipate having difficulty biting my tongue when I hear your very predictable takes on tar. Jamie's tar my, takes. My predictable takes on tar? F*** you. All right, we're going to get into it. Welcome, everyone, to You're Gonna Need a Bigger Bottle. Welcome. It's a podcast about movies and wine, and for those of you out there who don't know shit about one or both of those things, my name is Jamie, I'm the wine guy. He's Jamie, I'm Scott, I'm the movie guy, and we are here to help you. Each episode we pair a movie that I love with a wine that he loves. Uh, We tell you why we like them, how they're made, and why they work. Hopefully we find a pairing that works, usually we don't. Today, we are, as we have been for the past couple episodes, doing something a little different. Well, there really hasn't been a past couple episodes. <laughs> That's fair. I mean, there was there was that one a few weeks ago, and then there was the 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 ones that were doing the regular thing several months before that. Yeah, but that was that added food, though. That, the, the, you know what? The that was one. that was true. Anyway, it's Oscar season, baby. It's time. It's it's Hollywood's biggest night. Hooray for Hollywood! Don't call me baby. I was talking to the audience. Don't call them baby either. Well, I don't know. Maybe they <laughs> like being called baby. Maybe they think it's affectionate. Well, we're already getting into the thematic material of the of the movie here. Today we <laughs> yes, begin we a four episode miniseries covering the best picture nominees of the ninety fifth annual Academy Awards. We're starting off with my personal favorite movie of twenty twenty two, a little movie called Tar. Starring Kate Blanchett and written, produced, and directed by Todd Field. And then over the next three episodes, we'll cover the remaining nine nominees, three movies per episode. Uh, as of this recording, the nominations haven't been announced yet. Uh, and so this is a little bit cart before the horse, but like something will have to have gone catastrophically wrong for poor Tar and its Oscar chances if it doesn't get a Best Picture nominee at this point. And we're going to release this episode regardless. <laughs> I mean, we're not not putting it out there. So, yeah, maybe this will just stand on its own. Uh, So for the Oscars, I put together a small list of four bubbly wines. This is our third year covering the Best Picture nominees, and it's become a bit of a tradition to pair sparkling wine. Uh, I like I like to I like to celebrate with bubbles personally. What's different this year is that we're doing four episodes and leading off with just one movie. So after watching that movie, Tar, I picked the Rovero Brachetto. Available at chamberstreetwines.com for $19.99 plus tax and shipping. That's Chambers Street, S S T, Chambers S T Wines.com. Hmm, for $19.99 plus tax and shipping. Now, Jamie, that is a price point that I, for once, have no complaints about. I, I'm happy to uh, hear so it. So before before we talk tar, before we start talking some tar, uh, I'm I'm gonna open up this bottle and we I we, we'll do we'll do some tasting notes. We'll talk about we'll talk about the bubbles. Yeah, yeah, I'm down. I've I've already been sipping on it. Um, I am absolutely loving it. I had not previously tasted this wine. This is this do, is new. Do, to okay, me. so this this is new to you. What was this based on the pairing descriptive words that I gave you for tar, or was this just part of like your flight thing that you're doing? Yeah, this was part of just choosing four different sparkling wines that I think are representative stylistically across the board. And we haven't done one of these since where where you've gone like where it's a vertical tasting, right? Since The Matrix, was that the last time we did just one varietal thing? Well, yeah, that that was just Pinot Gris. This is just things with bubbles, which is br- definitely broader than using just one all right. Variety. So th- this is a sparkling. You did warn me ahead of time, so thank you. I have my bottle opener here. This is not wh- what is it called the like the the mushroom tipped cap. Yeah, sparkling so it's not, cap? it's not a champagne, champagne cork. cork. 
the, this looks like a regular cork, um, except when you get it out of the bottle, you'll notice that uh, it has a little bit more spring okay. to it. So I, I should anticipate some release of pressure when I open this here. Absolutely, you will. Yeah. All right. All right. Now it's a chilled bottle. I'm gonna I'm gonna open it on mic, and maybe maybe we'll get some some pressure and some pop, and hopefully not like a geyser fucking all over my keyboard here. If, if it's well chilled, you should be fine. My, mine opened without incident, but you know, when you're opening a bottle like this with a wine key, it's just helpful to know that there's some pressure in there so that you're not surprised when at the very end, the cork kind of pops out. All right, here goes. Ready? Yep. Disaster averted. Beautiful. Love to hear little, it. A little, little bit of a pop. I'm going to pour myself a glass here. Now, Jamie, this is a red wine. I mean, it looks a little bit rosé. Ooh. Uh, it, it's, very, it's, it's very, ooh. ooh. It's pale, pale mm. ruby in color. Ooh, that's numbers. Isn't it? Yeah. Ooh. So I want to get your tasting notes before I mm. do mine, but for everyone out there, this brachetto typically is vinified as like a very lightly sparkling wine. So like not, not an intense amount of bubbles, which is why it doesn't have the full cork and cage on it. It's just like, okay. So there it's, there's nothing wrong with my bottle then it's meant to be minimal bubblations here. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, otherwise it would require the, the full sparkling thing just because of the amount of pressure. Um, I think this comes in at like two atmospheres of pressure versus a bottle of champagne, which is five to six atmospheres of pressure. It's only 6% alcohol. There's a significant amount of residual sugar here. For me, this is one of my favorite, like, versatile dessert wines. As my, We did port last time, uh, and I love port, but it is heavy and thick and high alcohol. And sometimes at the very end of a meal, especially a really rich meal, that's not what you want. And, it's, and if your dessert is, like, fruit-based, um, you know, like a pavlova or, like, a fruit tart or something, or even just sorbet... Brachetto is a really, really great pair for something super light or just, you know, something with a little bit of bubbles to help you not feel so, as you would say, Scott, logy. Sometimes you feel logy, man. I know. It is. Know. It is a perfectly cromulent fake word. Sometimes I feel logy and I've heard other people use it and you can back off. I listen. I remember when you sent me that YouTube clip of, uh, of Colbert. Colbert. Colbert has used the word logy. He has. I and didn't so invent I will... it, and better people have used it. <laughs> you said it, not me. Uh, all right. So, so, so my notes. Other than other than minimal bubbles, and it's not just that there's not a lot of them; it's that they're smaller. Right? We've talked on previous sparkling episodes that the the size of the bubble. Yeah, I can't even see any. There was like a little bit of foam in the beginning, and now it's basically gone. Yeah, they're they're tiny, and there aren't that many of them. Yeah, it's like um like in various grits of sandpaper. This is a fine grit, a fine, fine grit. This is like drywall sandpaper, super fine grit. Mm, God, mm. I'm really loving it. This is, this is exactly what I need on a day like, on like a rainy day like today. I need something bright. On, and, a, on a rainy 11 in the morning. Uh, listen, man, it's almost noon. Well, it's I mean, 1158 we, we, because we, we, started, we took a long time yeah, setting up you because already someone had your was having open. video difficulties. I was having video difficulties. Shut up, Jamie. <laughs> We were going to be nice this time, and you're already antagonizing me. <laughs> yeah, I'm the one that started it. Anyway, uh, I'm getting like a so like a raspberries and strawberries thing. Yeah. So like ra raspberry note, extremely sweet. I, honestly, maybe maybe a little bit too sweet, maybe a little bit too much. But I'm getting like two notes separately: raspberries and strawberries and cream. Strawberries and cream is exactly what I was going to say. But I wouldn't say strawberry on its own. It's raspberry. I get that note on its own, and kind of, kind of like the, the the tartness and the acidity of raspberry. But then strawberries and cream. Uh, let's what, what else in 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 the body? This this is medium. Would you say medium body? Medium light, even you know. There's there's not a ton of body with this wine. I don't know. There's 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 mouth stick. Yeah, the sugar gives it a little bit more. So that that's that's the sugar. Is is that mm -hmm. actually body, or is the sugar creating an illusion of more body? No, no. The body is is the viscosity of a thing, right? And so any dissolved solids add to it. Fuck, that's good. But it's it's mega sweet. Let's see what what else. T tannins low, very low on the tannins. Yeah, I don't get any any yeah, tannins this week. No, no, no tannins. Acidity like medium minus acidity. 
Well, I, See, I, I think, guess I guess I'm getting a little bit of the, the 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 mouth sweats there. There there's some acidity. There is, and it it can be tough because this is a wine that has sugar, right? Uh, and sugar will decrease your perception of acidity, and acidity will decrease your perception of sweetness. Huh. Um. So they they sort of balance, and in this case, sugar is winning the balance. Uh, it is definitely tipped toward you know toward a sweet presentation. What are you getting on the nose? I'm not getting a huge amount. Almost like a like a like a musty thing, not quite barnyard, but like I don't know, like dank basement. I think it's herbal more than it is dank or basementy, but herbal. um like leafy, you know, I, something like green and leafy, like a fresh yeah. bag of kale. Um or like like maybe I was because I was just eating Vietnamese food yesterday, but like Thai basil. I also um, had Vietnamese food yesterday. I love I love Vietnamese food. Well, it's whenever whenever anybody in our house is sick, we get pho, and we get like an extra two quarts of pho. So when we're done recording today, I'm gonna go chug a quart of pho broth. <laughs> that is that'll keep you hydrated, keep you healthy. There is nothing better when you are sick than pho broth. I other tend than to like agree. you know medicine and rest and stuff, but like pho broth is restorative and magical. It is. Um, lots of nutrients and, and helps keep you hydrated too. Um, but yeah, I think that there's like a Thai basil thing going on, something green leafy, maybe a little minty, minty strawberries and cream in a big, big way. Yeah. Um, and then that raspberry thing I think is almost like a, like raspberry candy, like a hard raspberry candy. Yeah. I, I gotta say, I really like it. It is too sweet. If it it's was, very sweet. if it was a little less sweet, I I could see myself in danger of like drinking most of this bottle today. But it's like it's too sweet, and I feel like after a glass or two, I'm probably going to want to pump the brakes in a big way. Yeah, I'm I'm in a similar camp. I think that once again, if we if we had like a light dessert to have with this, if we had maybe some like almond biscotti or or a fruit tart or some sorbet, even. Um, that would help deal with the, the sweetness of the wine. Um, but it by itself, you know, it's nice to have a glass, maybe two glasses. It's certainly not, you're not going to take down a bottle, even though it is only 6% alcohol. It's only 6% alcohol. Yep. And why am I feeling a buzz already? Cause you were sick yesterday, bud. That's true. I was sick yesterday. And prior to all that pho that I ate last night, I ate nothing. It was terrible. You're going to feel the effects of alcohol much faster. Fuck. All right. Good thing I have no food in front of me and several more hours of recording. <laughs> uh, so, so for people, people planning their, their Oscar parties, would you, I mean, what, what is this? Do you, do you say like, Hey, get a case of these and pass them around? Or is this something you save towards the end of the course as, I don't know, desserts are being served and we're closing in on the major awards coming out. I don't know. Do people even do Oscar parties? Is that something people do? I have no idea. Certainly I don't. Well, except for the one that I threw that you attended last year. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I think that this wine's play, this wine is, has a really great, like for, for people who like wine, the broad category of wine, this fits firmly in like either aperitif territory, you drink it like before a meal as something just kind of stimulating, or after a meal as something very light and, and easy. Um, but there, there's a subset of people who like really just want their wine sweet and easy, and having this open at any moment in, in mixed company, um, someone is going to find that this is what they like. This feels like... like what as a child you would imagine champagne should taste like. Yes. Well yeah. said. Uh, very sweet, very drinkable, very easy and welcoming. And, and yet Jamie, and this is your fault. Uh, uh, this is a wine that probably would have been one of my favorites just a few years ago. And now I find it too sweet and maybe even cloying. I don't, I'm, I'm gonna pour another glass and find out. It doesn't take to the level of cloying for me, but definitely it's, it's sweet. It's a little bit much to have on its own. Um, the, the reason I chose it is because after watching Tar, I think you need a little bit, a little bit of lightness in your life. Jesus yeah. Christ. This wine is not Tar. So not, not that it's relevant to, to the particular choice here. It's not actually a pairing, but what I told you uh, about tar uh, in terms of wine language is that it is haunted 
knotty, tannic, and enigmatic. And this wine is none of those things. None of those things, no. This wine is delightful in its own right, but it is not tar. This is the contrapuntal pairing to tar. This is the, like, you're about to sit down for two hours and 38 minutes of unpleasantness. Uh, and maybe you want to to have a little liveliness in your life. I think that's not fair. It's not exclusively unpleasantness. Um, there's there's a lot of joy. There's a lot of aesthetic beauty. Uh, the performances are wonderful. There is some, not a lot, but there is some humor. Sure, uh, some, some but very it's largely dark humor. creeping dread that culminates in horribleness. Uh, yeah. But this this wine is not that. I found myself wanting something sweet while I was watching the movie. Yeah, but re- like literally, the thought crossed my mind as I was watching Tar. I was drinking beer, uh, and I was like, I don't want to be drinking this anymore. I want something. I want something sweet. Yeah, I was uh, not and- drinking last night. I was a little sensitive about about my my, my tummy scrumbos. I was a little worried that any kind of alcohol, especially bubbly stuff, would just like agitate a very a very uncertain situation. Uh, so, so I didn't, but if I were to, I, I, I'm yeah, th- this, I would also not want with tar, but I think like you said before, this, I would want after tar, but like with, with tar, I would either want, I would want something big and kind of complex and dark and tannic or I, I don't know, like a series of bourbon cocktails or something. Like I, mm, bourbon would be a good choice. You're right. Bourbon, bourbon with tar. I feel like would would work pretty well. Or scotch. I I wonder what 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 does Lydia drink? Well, so you you open you open a question. Well, we'll have to come back to this. But what what does Lydia drink here? I'm gonna add that into the outline, and <laughs> we'll we'll talk about it later. What does okay. Lydia drink? Um. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the wine, and then we can get we can get into the movie. We can, um, we can do some tar takes. Yeah, yeah, some tar takes. Okay, um, some t- tarks. No, it's bad. No, it's it's tar takes. You want the alliteration there? Yeah, you're yeah. you're right. I'm wrong. You're right. T A with some kind of accent. R. This fucking movie has forced me to learn how to add the A with the accent on multiple devices. <laughs> yeah, it's easy on a touch screen because you just hold it down and it like pops up for you. Well, with a, um, with a Mac, it's also a long press. Is it really? Yeah, it's just long press A and then it gives you for A, it's eight different options for accents. And then you either arrow left and right to pick it or it gives you like a faded numeric drop down thing as well. That would be a lot easier if that's the way it was on PC. Mm, yeah. This has been a, a thrilling subsegment of the show that everyone will enjoy. <laughs> how, how to put accented text into your text strings. I've I've memorized a lot of accents using the alt, you know, keypad patterns just because of like you know, wine things. Right. So well, you're, to, you're doing a lot of French stuff and Italian stuff and you get all the accents. Right. And, so yeah. I've just memorized those things and I wonder what, uh, what has left my brain as a result. Anyway, this wine is called Rovero Piemonte Brachetto. Ro- the Rovero family is one of the families in Piedmont that's been there for centuries, um, or at least they claim to be with Italians. I'm always a little bit dubious about their claims of longevity because Italy hasn't been a country for a full century yet. So why, why should we believe them? The, the reason that I'm familiar with the brand um, is that they make a number of Amari um, and liqueurs. They're, they're also a, a distiller. Um, and I haven't really been exposed much to their wines, um, because as we mentioned before, uh, Pennsylvania sucks, and not a lot of them come into PA. But I was looking for something to fit this category, this like kind of sweet, bubbly category, and th- their Brichetto showed up on the Chamber Street website. And I was like, that sounds perfect. Uh, I love Brichetto. Um, it's a grape that is typically made in this style. It's sort of the same style if anyone out there has also had Moscato di Asti. Um, this like light, bubbly style Brichetto is the Red or rosé counterpart to Moscato. Typically 6 to 8% alcohol, a little bit of bubbles, plenty of sugar, easy drinking. And I think it's delicious. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those wineries that's neither big nor small. 
Um, they they have about 25 hectares of land, and they also purchase a significant amount of fruit for their distillates. Um, so it's a, it's a sizable estate, but they're all organic, and they also raise honeybees and vegetables and animals, and they're they're on the natural leaning side of the spectrum, um, despite the fact that this wine presents very very clean and classic. Wait, so this this is. This is not a natty, but this is on the nattier side. Yeah, it's it's native yeast, farmed organically. Uh, you know, they they definitely use a little bit of sulfur at bottling to keep it stable. You know, when you're bottling a wine with sugar, there's always the danger of it re-fermenting in the bottle. So you really have to add a little bit of sulfur. And some of the the natty boys out there are against that, but I think. You know, these are businesses and these are businesses that keep food on families' tables and to, to risk losing product and losing sales and losing income over like the dogma of natural wine really isn't helpful. And these people make wine in an honest way. So I say use a little sulfur to, to protect your investment. Well, and, and I say that most, not all, but most of the natties that I've had have been funky to the point of unpleasantness. And the way you've described them is that they're so wildly unpredictable sometimes in their results that like, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you do a, just a, a little bit of intervention? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. A I, I advocate for, you know, we want these things to be honest products of the land, but we can't like go so far as to say that all of the bacteria in the cellar of whatever winery is like, quote unquote, natural. Um, and so I really respect the people that take the time to make the right decisions thoughtfully. Is that the only intervention? Is the addition of sulfur? Well, I mean, the the bubbles themselves are an intervention. This is fermented, you know, not in a traditional fermenter, um, but in what's called an autoclave. Um, it's essentially a pressurized vat so that the primary fermentation actually captures the CO2 and dissolves it in solution uh, as opposed to allowing it to, um, or rather like force carbonation or doing a secondary fermentation. Hmm. Uh, so that, that I would consider to be an intervention, you know, no, no sparkling wine is made naturally, but none of them are made naturally. There's all intervention. Agriculture is intervention. Harvesting is intervention, yes. putting it in a barrel, right? Wine didn't ever happen by accident. That is, that is correct. And I fully agree with it. Right. So it seems like the dogma, I'm just, I'm just setting you up here for, for a fucking home run. It seems like the dogma of the Natty Boys is inherently like short-sighted and, and flawed. Yes, I agree with that. Okay. Uh, the, the, the dogma is kind of dumb because the whole thing is predicated on things that humans do. And none of it is natural to, to the environment. Agriculture itself is unnatural. Uh, it's just there are better more regenerative, more responsible ways to do it. And that's what we should be thinking about. And we should be thinking about ways to make that sustainable for the people that do it thoughtfully. And perhaps even more importantly, we should be thinking about the ways that people like me who have to drink the wine sometimes have to spit out a bunch of chunkus because somebody doesn't want to use a fucking sieve or whatever to get all that weird chunkus matter out of the wine. I like the chunkus. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I, l I have liked several of the natural wines that we've drank, but the Chunkus is always the worst part. Actually, my, my number one wine of last year, um, I drank on Thanksgiving at my, my orphan's Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And it was towards the end of the night, and I just had the right people in the room, and I've been holding on to this bottle of um, Ambeth Priscus. Priscus is the name of the wine. Ambeth is the winery. Um, and Ambeth is a winery in Paso Robles, and they're like super crazy funky natty. Um, when I was out there in 2017 and I visited them, it's the you, you kind of like all the way off the beaten path so much so that you're on a dirt road, and then suddenly you're not really on a road anymore, and you drive up the side of the mountain to get to this house, and you get to the house, and the whole family is just kind of hanging out with the dogs uh, and – they assure you that the tasting room's open, and when you get there, it's just a guy without a shirt on tasting you on the wines, and it's all native yeast fermentation, and everything kind of smells like funk, and it permeates everything, and I've really loved their wines, but they are difficult to get with for people who don't love that flavor profile, 
And Priscus has always held significance for me because it was one of the one of the wines that got me into natural wine to begin with. Anyway, I purchased a bottle of 2012 Priscus while I was there, and I've been holding on to it, and I had the right people in the room, and we popped it, and it was singing. It was absolutely gorgeous. Uh, it just had this this incredible like beeswax floral floral like honeysuckle kind of thing going on with just like a little bit of barnyard to it. Positively stunning, incredible acidity, but so so much chunkus, just like grape matter in the bottle. It was it was a lot. That sounds horrible. Why so much chunkus? They just don't want to filter. And did you filter? Did you do a courtesy for your guests nope, and just filter? We, we drank all the chunkus. You know what you should do? This would be a great thing that you could do. You could you could get together with like a glass blower or something, and you could pioneer either individual wine glasses or probably more pragmatically uh, a decanter that has a screen or a filter built into it. The, doing it on every wine glass would be funnier, but I think just in terms of like sales ability or, or, it, or it's a decanter that has a, a, like a screen that's specifically fitted to go on top. So you pour the whole bottle into the thing with all the chunkus, let it decant. And then there's a screen that is specifically fitted to sit on top and then you can pour it back out and it catches all the chunkus for you. It's a wonderful idea. I'm absolutely going to do that. I would buy it. I truly would. I know you would. Yeah, because the chunkus is gross. Sometimes you want a little chunkus was the reason why I brought that bottle up. It was why, wonderful. This, you, this was not a good, this was a very long walk to get to. The chunkus still sounds like no one enjoyed it. We all, it, it wasn't like the gritty, tough, like tartrate crystals or fallen out tannins. It was like no, soft. No, it's just a bunch of shit in your glass. And it was, it was tasty. It goes down easy. No, I, I don't know. It sounds terrible. <laughs> you probably would have hated this wine. It was not. Not a Scotty wine, um, but uh, well, those, I mean, those if it has all those those chunks in it. It's got whole grapes in the glass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not far off. There was a lot of grape matter in the fucking bottle. Yeah. Honestly, I'm surprised that it even made its way through the bottling machine. But it was delicious. That, that sounds that sounds horrible. The chunk is sounds horrible. I know. Anyway, there's no chunkus in this bruchetto. It's, you know, it's fine. It's, it's filtered. It's it's liquid. No solids at all. Correct. Uh, and it tastes like strawberries and cream. Yeah, it's 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 mega nums, but but a little it's just, it's just it's, a little it's, much. It's I just sweet. need a little bit less. Oh, there's like a hint of like a almost like a mandarin orange thing there and mm. kind of in the background yeah. too. But, you know, another fruit that is extremely hyper sweetened. Yeah, it has a it has a real candy like finish, mm. almost like gummy bears, gummy worms, kind of like once you're done eating them, um, that that kind of feeling left in your mouth. But I really like it. I'm I'm enjoying the hell out of myself. I'm glad we opened it today. I'm enjoying it as well. How would you? So let's let's set the stage for for what's to come because uh, we've got three more sparklings in the next couple of weeks. What I guess people really haven't had a chance to have them. But like, wh where where would you fit this? in in the flight that you have chosen for me and ostensibly the audience. So the, this one fits kind of um, at either end for me. As I, as I mentioned earlier, this is either an aperitif or a dessert wine in my eyes. This is either like with past appetizers like prosciutto and melon um, or just alone as a way to wake up your palate. Or it's at the end of a very heavy meal where you really can't deal with port or amaro or something more heavy and you just want something light for God's sake. The primary reason I chose this with tar is because tar is, was a difficult watch and I just kind of wanted some, some, as I say, lightness in my life while, while thinking about that movie, but also because it's sort of the aperitif to start, to start this series off. Get the juices flowing. I, I think in the arc of the miniseries, uh, it, it, that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, as, as a tar pairing, you swing, swing and a miss. I'm going to respectfully disagree. It is a tar chaser, but not a pairing. I, th I think it would, ju it would just help some of the emotional blows that happened during that, you know, two hour and 40 minute movie. Well, yeah, but, but it would, I could only have a little bit either at the beginning of tar when she's doing her New Yorker talk, or I could have some at the end of tar, but I couldn't have some all throughout the tar. And once again, I disagree. Well, all right, fine. 
Let's see how much longer we can both drink this wine before we give up and switch to water. I mean, I've been drinking water all along because you should always be drinking water when you're drinking alcohol. I am also drinking water. But you're also not supposed to be drinking alcohol, Jamie. That's According the to the Canadian fucking Board of Canadian Health. government, f*** you, Canada. Well, Jamie, who do you trust more, the Canadians or the American government? Well, the American government also similarly says kind of don't drink alcohol. Um, I'm going to go ahead and trust France on this one. Yeah, France, with all of the completely reasonable and rational laws about wine consumption and production. Okay, point made. Move along. Indeed. <laughs> Can we talk about my good friend Lydia now? I, I think it's Linda, actually. Jamie, spoilers. Spoilers. <laughs> all right? Because no one has seen this movie, so you can't just be lobbing up spoilers about Linda. Why has no one seen this movie? It's very frustrating. It's very frustrating. Well, why don't we so start me, with that? Why hasn't well, anyone seen this movie, Scott? Well, Jamie, because despite the what has been called a major post-pandemic box office rebound of 2022, led by things like Top Gun Maverick and Avatar and other gigantic mega hits, the, the thing is that the box office rebound is like puddle deep. It's very shallow. If you go beyond the big gigantic mega blockbusters and like a couple of like standout horror films uh, and a couple of genre hits, nothing is actually making money. All right. So let me, let me put it to you this way. The Fablemans, the new movie from Steven Spielberg. Okay. Yeah. Like maybe the best known director on the planet. And it, while it's not a franchise or like a big sci-fi thing, like he's dabbled in in the past, it's a big drama from Steven Spielberg, and that movie has made, I believe as of this recording, $13 million at the domestic box office. Wow. Like, even just a couple of years ago, like, that thing would have caked walk to, like, 70 or 80. Uh, and and th this is coming, like, for him, this is coming right after uh, the complete box office failure of West Side Story. Uh, now, that had other things going on, like, it was right at the... Uh, beginning of the Omicron surge, but people managed to go out and see fucking Kid Spider-Man No Way Home uh, and made that like the highest grossing thing of all time, sort of, not really. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's that the box office rebound has largely not touched art house theaters and it hasn't really touched dramas. Dramas aren't making money. Movies for adults aren't making money. If you look at the box office response, it seems like adults what's called the 35 to 35 to 50 or 35 to 65 bracket in terms of like box office demographic breakdowns. Why are we which is horrified? I don't like being in that group. It, it's just how they group things. Uh, but like the, the, the 35s and ups adults have largely not returned to the theaters. And when they do, it's for things that you have to see on the big screen, like your avatars and whatnot. And I'm just as guilty of going to see those movies, but like I'll also go out and see Tar on like a Tuesday night in an empty fucking theater. Tar is like one of the best reviewed films of the year. It was named the best film by many, many, many organizations, including the prestigious New York Film Critics Circle, the LA Film Critics Association, the National Society of Film Critics, and, and it's made less than $6 million. Like it has Kate Blanchett, a huge fucking star. Uh, it is guaranteed to get a bunch of Oscar noms and, and no one, no one has seen it. And there's talk about like, well, maybe it's the controversial subject matter that's putting people off. And like, no, it's, it's just that adults aren't coming out to see dramas. It's weird. It's not surprising, but it's weird. And it's something that was happening before the pandemic, but then the pandemic really point. accelerated it. it. It's been happening before COVID. But then the pandemic and the shift to streaming and all of the major media conglomerates emphasizing streaming over theatrical and shifting things to streaming much more quickly, they've just devalued the theatrical experience for basically anything other than Avatar and Top Gun and their ilk. And like the only real standout uh, in terms of like, quote unquote, art house movies or, or dramas or adult fare is everything everywhere all at once. Which, which made relatively a ton of money. It did like 60 million at the US box office, which is huge for a movie like that, for something that's that weird and specific and from a smaller distributor like A24. But like your, your, your Tars, your Fablemans, your Babylons, like are, are all just cratering at the box office. It's bananas and it sucks. So we're, we're going to be spoiler sensitive until we're not. 
because presumably almost no one listening to this has seen Tar, which they could rectify, because just as of two days ago of this recording, it's finally available to rent on VOD for five ninety nine, and people should do that. That's that's an easy price to pay. Yeah, uh, beats the hell out of the twenty seven ninety nine I spent for a four K ultra high def disc, which is gorgeous, but also is going to be like ten dollars in a month, and I'm annoyed. <laughs> But I was going to buy it anyway. You did it to yourself. Well, we also had to watch it for the show. And so I got it. And that got you a free digital copy, sir. It did. And I very much appreciated that. So let me set the table. Set that table. Sitar, T-A with the accent. And the title, weirdly, is all caps. It's not just that it's on the poster. Anywhere that you see the title referenced, it's all caps. Uh, But so Tar uh, is written and directed by Todd Field. It's his first film since 2006's Little Children, which was like one of the best American dramas of the aughts. Uh, He's finally back, thank goodness. Uh, And it stars Kate the Great Blanchett as Lydia Tarr, a fictional, this will come up later, fictional orchestra conductor uh, reaching the peak of her powers and fame just as her not-so-secret history of abusive behavior is about to be exposed to the world. Uh, It's an intimate character study in which Blanchett is in every single scene of its two-hour, 40-minute runtime. It's Baroque, and it's provocative, and it's extremely timely to the moment we're living in right now, Uh, exploring sometimes contrasting ideas about power structures, about the arts, about family structures, gender identity, generational gaps, social media, uh, and also ghosts. Uh, as I mentioned, it's one of the best reviewed movies of the year. It's made roughly $7, uh, worldwide. Um, but as of this recording, it is a presumptive lock for several major Oscar noms, including best picture, best director, best actress, Kate Blanchett, best original screenplay for Todd Field as well. Best original score for Hildur Gunnadotter, uh, who amusingly is also name dropped in the movie. Uh, I personally would also throw in nominations for Florian Hoffmeister's Cinematography, Nina Haas for Best Supporting Actress. She plays Lydia's partner, co-parent, and the first violin of the orchestra, Sharon. Uh, And a nomination for Best Sound for the extraordinary uh, immersive and subtle sound mix. And of course, Best Original Song for Apartment for Sale, written by Field and Blanchet. (laughs) Jamie, what did you think of Tar? Well... Going in. Uh, oh, wait, hang on, hang on. Before before you say that, we, we have a little guest to join us. Um, I just shared with Jamie a, a, little, a little picture of, of Lydia joining me for my private screening of Tar last night. Ay, ay, ay. My, my demented wife made me a custom Lydia Tar cardboard standee as a Christmas gift, uh, and she haunts us everywhere we go. Uh, and if I had gotten my video component working, Lydia would have been like lurking in the background the whole time. Just staring at Jamie as he said negative things about her character. Well, I mean, she's she's bad. I, I think it's a little more complex than that. But you, you go ahead, go ahead, Jamie. I've, listen, man, if she were a man doing the yeah. exact same things yeah. that she was doing on screen, you would yeah. not be saying that it's more complex than that. Mm, no, I don't. It's it's not about that. But go go ahead, go ahead. Do, and and I guess at this point, it's it's spoiler warnings. Yeah, I mean, we, we got to talk about the elephant in the room, which is that Lydia Tarr is terrible. Uh, Lydia Tarr is, I mean, ir- irredeemably bad. Uh, she's arguably a good parent. I'll give her that. Although she does... She, she seems like a good parent. She does threaten another child with bodily harm. She doesn't threaten her with bodily harm. She does. It's, it's, it's it is implied... Impl- she says, she I'll says, get you. Scott. I'll get you. Yes. And she says it she in says, German, which is extra threatening. Wow. Wow, Jamie. <laughs> wow. You know who would say something like that about the Germans and their language? Lydia Tarr. <laughs> I mean, she, she's inarguably a great artist and a, and a great musical mind. Uh, and it was, as we have said a number of times on this podcast, it's fun to watch people do the things that they are good at. Um, and it's, it's fun watching the beginning as she's like seeing success and taking meetings that are, you know, talking about future projects and talking about the, the things that she's writing and then getting in front of the orchestra and really like commanding the space. But then you get sort of in the weeds with Lydia, uh, and she, she's bad. (laughs) She's broken from the start and she, uh, she like makes her brokenness everyone else's problem. 
um, and specifically the young women that work for her. She engaged in some amount of malfeasance with a, a young woman named Krista. We don't know exactly what happened, but we know that it was bad. And she know that it, we know that it involved her current assistant, uh, whose name is escaping me. It's Francesca. Francesca. Um, and we know that the, she then orders Francesca to delete all correspondence from Krista. Which is pretty short-sighted, Lydia, because, like, email goes both ways. I was thinking you, that. <laughs> just because just you delete it, like, this, this is the thing, Lydia, like, farming out all of your email correspondence to your assistants means that, like, after a while, maybe you forget that, like, just deleting it doesn't make it go away. Yeah. Um, so I have complicated thoughts about this movie because I enjoyed watching it. It's a compelling story. It's a compelling character study about someone who is in my view, just objectively bad. Um, she, she is a villain and that enjoyment is a little bit colored by the fact that I know that if this movie was made about a straight man and not about a lesbian, it, it would never see the light of day. Interesting. Counter, if you will. Well, no, I want to, I want to hear, I want to hear what you have to say, but, but I, I'm, 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 I don't necessarily agree, but go ahead. I mean, character studies have been done about terrible men, but in 2023, this isn't, that's not the type of story that anyone really is going to tolerate seeing, right? This, this is a, this is a movie about a sexual predator Mm -hmm. uh, and, and humanizing that sexual predator. Yeah. And I'm not saying once again, that that hasn't been done before for men, but now it would not, it would not ever. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit, you know, knowing that maybe we, that that type of story, I don't know what kind of value that type of story has, uh, humanizing a, a villain, but I didn't, I did enjoy the experience. I just have complicated thoughts afterwards. Why? Well, I, I mean, that's, that's the crux of the whole movie. That's why it's challenging. That's why there's value to it. That it's that that's the principal provocation of the movie is making you empathize with a woman who is slowly revealed to be a predator, even though she would never phrase it that way. And I think by the end, she maybe like finally comes to confront it. Not only is she a predator, she is a violent criminal by the end. That that is true. Yeah. But we're but we're with her. It's so subjective. She's in every single scene. The 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 subjectivity isn't just to the camera, but also to the sound. Uh, the the sound design places us in Lydia's auditory experience of the world. It makes you live with all of these things the way that she has to live with them. Yeah, it's it's challenging. But but to say that you don't see the value in telling a story like that, like I I. And like, I'm, I'm, I was being glib, like, obviously Lydia is a monster, right? And it seems like Krista is not like clearly not the first young woman that Lydia has groomed and traded career advancement for sexual favors or for sexual relationships. Yeah. Like there is clearly a pattern. In fact, we see two of them happen. We see Francesca. So the Francesca thing is interesting because it's only ever implied. We don't know that there is that kind of sexual relationship with Francesca, but there there is one moment where it's implied. It's it's implied it's implied enough for me to take it as like this is this is the thing. And and then her reaction to not getting like Lydia's response to the accusations is to then not give Francesca the promotion that she was planning to give her. Just as cover because there's already things burbling about Krista. Right. And so Francesca's response to that is to be like, okay, fuck you. We had a quid pro quo, quid pro quo worked out. I'm going to now disappear and spill all of your dirt. I think that's pretty proof positive that it, that it was that type of relationship. Uh, and then she tries it again right afterwards with Olga. Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's tough. It's tough. For me, what I what I find so fascinating and provocative about the movie is is this very conversation, uh, because because what we want to do, right, as as progressive, very online, like young American people, is we we want to condemn them, right? Like Kevin Spacey, boom, fuck you, you're a predator. I never want to hear about you again. You're a monster. 
uh, and uh, I was going to say Harvey Weinstein, but like genuinely, I think he's a troll that crawled out from under a bridge somewhere and that there's no humanity to be found there. But like the, the, the movie is challenging that notion by reminding us like, no, these people are people too, right? She, she's still a person. It doesn't absolve her of responsibility for any of her many, many, many sins. It doesn't uh, try and say, well, because of her past or her childhood that like, it, it doesn't even point to any specific thing thing you know it's not like well there's a late in the movie flashback and here's the trauma that led to lydia's behavior like it's it's much more benign than that it's it's about power structures and it's about her coming up and seeing the power structures that were all around her and chasing them and embracing them and then repeating those patterns back uh, you 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 asked like if, if this was a movie that was about a straight man, you, you said that nobody would see it. And you know what? I, I think you're probably right. And I think that's part of the reason that the movie is so effective is that we haven't really seen that story about a woman yet, like in, in, in the public eye, right? It's mostly men who are getting caught doing these things. And it's probably mostly men who are doing it, but by it, it kind of disarms you a little bit by having it be a woman and by having it be Kate Blanchett who brings so much like integrity uh, and respectability to it to begin with. And charisma. And charisma. But like just to slowly reveal the, like it's just a series of red flags throughout it. And then and then the red flags get harder and harder to ignore as the movie speeds up and we move kind of inexorably towards like her getting canceled, which was kind of like the, the reductive log line on the movie when it was first coming out. The first thing I heard about it was that it's the Todd Field, Kate Blanchett movie about a conductor who gets canceled. And, and a lot of the early conversations were just like, is tar a repudiation of cancel culture, which is just like entirely missing the point. It's, it's engaging with that and it's discussing it, but it's not saying this shouldn't happen. And it's also being more honest than a lot of people really are about cancel culture because spoilers, Lydia survives cancellation and continues working and continues getting to do the thing that she loves, admittedly in a different country and in a reduced artistic capacity. But like, she's not gone. You know, these people aren't gone. Louis C.K. is fucking doing stand-up shows. Yeah. Bill Cosby is planning a fucking comeback, which is insane. Uh, I, 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 I think the, the value is just in looking at these things honestly and saying like, yes, she's a monster, but she's also a human being. And look at what a human being can do to other people. And like, what must it feel like to be that human being? It makes you empathize with someone who you should hate. Who like on Twitter, you would hate her, but I, she is so fucking compelling and interesting and layered and deep as a person that it it's it, it just on that alone in, in the efforts to empathize with a soon to be canceled sexual predator like the, the, the movie is 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 kind of profound and shocking and, and challenging. I will say that it's a little bit difficult, even in the early parts of the movie to empathize with her. I, I agree with everything you've said and, and it's a, I may not have expressed it in the past, but it's a thought that I've had a lot about people who get canceled. You know, I, I think the, the zeitgeist is that we just don't want to see or hear from them ever again, but they are people and they have to live and do, do these crimes mean that they are to be put to death effectively. Um, right. These people still kind of deserve to, at the very least live, breathe, eat, but Lydia herself is just so deep into this, the like the highest part of musical expertise and culture. And like, she's dining at the finest restaurants and she, she gets called maestro. It's I, I did find it difficult to empathize with her. She's like in a, in a whole other class. Um, that I'm very much unfamiliar with. But you're, you're familiar with people. You're familiar with like people who have partners and who have like relationships with colleagues. And like, you're at least familiar with people who have children, even though you don't have children of your own. Like, For sure. All, all of her individual relationships are interesting. E even if she herself is at times alienating and off putting. She, that's what I'm saying. She is I think not at times. I think most most of the time she is alienating and off-putting. Which is which is why I found it difficult to click in with the character. And I guess that that is a positive thing because by the end, you know, the, 
she she is a monster she's horrible and it's right that she is you know off in the middle of nowhere conducting a synchronized performance of what presumably is an anime for cosplayers i think i think it's from monster hunter that that is the music cue that is credited right at the beginning in the the inverse pyramid of of the the credits which i really like is a nice touch uh, but yeah, it's something from the Monster Hunter video games, maybe? Sure. Uh, but yeah. That that also, that end bit did have, I don't know, it, it gave me pause, uh, right? Because we are at the end equating equating work in the in the third world in the Philippines to something that is bad, that that a, is deserving of a bad person. <laughs> and I, I, I don't I, I don't didn't f- love that. I don't think that's I, I can see why you would make that that leap for for the audiences, like for anybody who's still with us who hasn't seen the movie somehow by the end of the movie, after the shit has hit the fan and Lydia's like pattern and history of abuses has been revealed and her PR team is like, we, we need to think of this as a reset and we need less of you right now, but she still needed to work. So she's in unnamed like Southeast Asian country. I thought the Philippines uh, and she is conducting an orchestra. Uh, what, what, but, but I don't, I, I don't think the location is about like the, the, the fact is that it's, it, it's the, you know, how the mighty have fallen, but it's not about the geography of it. Yeah. But it's they do spend the, some time with her in the cities and like interacting with poor people, uh, which is a thing that we never see from her in the beginning. It's just, it's not. I'm not saying that it was intentional, but the the meta textual of it all um, doesn't look great. Well, but it but I think it is intentional, but it's because we're subjective to Lydia. To her, this is a downfall and not because she's in a country with non-white people that are all over the place, but because she's no longer in the like four cities that she name checks all the time is the only places that a conductor should care about, which is. New York, Berlin, Vienna, and London, right? right? Like she, she's not conducting the best. And the, the biggest strike, it, it's not even the poverty. Uh, it's that she has lost the ability to control time like that. That's the body blow of the ending, uh, is that she's conducting music that has to be synced to playback, right? She's got headphones on that are basically giving her like a metronome, yeah. which is the thing that, that she says right in the beginning in her very self aggrandizing and uncomfortable New Yorker talk which is that she controls time uh, and that it's it's not about the illusion that she's responding to what the orchestra does. It's that her internal clock is consistent and that she is the one who is in complete control of time. And she's lost that now. What, why I, do they even need a fucking conductor at that point? I, I get that. Uh, and I agree with you. I think my point is that it, it, that could have been accomplished by putting her somewhere in, let's say the Midwest of America just not not equating the poverty of Southeast Asia to be like purgatory. Um, I think, and I, I think and I get, that's on. I, I think that's on you. I think I think that's you bringing that baggage to it. I, I, dis- I, I fundamentally felt, disagree. Of course uh, you do. Yeah. I, I felt that that was more about her going somewhere that either isn't as keyed into like Western cancel culture. Uh, or to somewhere that maybe where, where that type of cancellation is not like a death sentence, you know, like she, the, I mean, I mean, I, I, I guess she could be conducting a synchronized video game concert performance of student musicians. It seems like yep. anywhere, but she, she had to go to the other side of the world for her name and face to not be a problem essentially. Yes. Um, and I'm, I'm just saying the, those shots of her, you know, on the back of a truck with what are very obviously like impoverished kids, you know, it, yes, it's subjective to, to Lydia, uh, and for her, that is death. Um, but putting it up on screen in a broader way, I think communicates that maybe the like being in an impoverished area in the middle of the South Pacific is death. And maybe we shouldn't be even hinting at that, but that's, that's kind of a minor gripe. Re- really. It's, I don't have a gripe with this movie. I really, really like it, but it was a, it was a tough watch. And I don't agree with you that Lydia is in any way empathetic. 
I, I find her empathetic just by virtue of spending so much time with her and having an amazing performance from Kate Blanchett, like a woman who's given dozens of incredible performances in her career. And this has to be like the fucking towering achievement uh, in that career. Uh, and and also just the 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 depth with which that character is rendered. It is hard not to empathize with somebody when you're living in their headspace for so many hours. Even even when that person is so far up their own ass and continues to make the wrong decision at every turn. Yes, because you know who else makes wrong decisions at every turn. Ooh. People, I, people do it all the time. My, my guy, she's continually told to like either out loud or by forces outside to like, to not get the fuck off. And she continually I'm, I'm not, does not not get the fuck off. It. I don't, I'm not, I, I agree with you that people fuck up uh, and people fuck up in, on a, in a continual way. But like, I don't, I, I this is. It's not it's not an empathetic character to me be, because not only is she fucking up so completely and so thoroughly and so often, but also she's a part of this world that is just like even more high minded and up their own ass than the fucking wine people that I deal with, uh, which is tough to say. I mean, I, I didn't want to say it, but this this movie isn't really about classical music, right? Like, it's not really about like the 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 fancy conducting world it's it's about power structures in any creative form or even like any non-creative form right it it could just as easily be about i don't know the master chord of sommelier could very or easily be that yes right but so he, here's my thing i empathize with her that doesn't mean i don't judge her you know like L lydia is an asshole she's an asshole and her behavior is predatory and she knows it even if she won't admit to it. And you know that she knows it because she's always trying to cover up her shit. But there, there, there are just things about like her physical experience of the world that make her empathetic to me. The way that, I, I forget what it's called. There's a, there's a auditory neurological syndrome and it's it's people who are like it, they mention it in the movie about about some other famous composer who some people who are so keyed into their audio their their auditory experience of the world that like they can't deal with twitching or like background noises or shit like that yeah and we, we see that with lydia constantly the the compulsion when um there's a bit during the new yorker talk with adam gopnik where there's like some kind of like repetitive noise that she's like twitching about and trying to ignore or in the really long fucking masterpiece uh, of a scene uh, at Juilliard uh, where she's like a fucking horrible bully to that one student, Max. Uh, but his leg is always jimmying because he's nervous because like she's a huge star and she's being mean to him. And she literally puts a hand on his leg to stop him. Or with Sebastian, the assistant conductor who keeps clicking his pen and she's like obsessed with stopping that. Like little, little things like that. I feel empathy towards that. I feel like not with like putting a hand on someone to stop a behavior because the behavior is her problem, not his. Uh, but like I can empathize with somebody because I, I shit like that can bother me. Background noises and, and clicking and weird things and compulsive behaviors. Uh, and it's, it, that's just like one way into her or her relationship with her daughter, Petra. Uh, I think is beautiful, even if Lydia, you know, essentially behind the scenes without the kid knowing about it, threatens the child and is terrible. Or her relationship with her partner, Sharon, uh, I, I think is beautifully realized. And those two performances from Blanchett and Nina Haas are are incredible. Uh, and, and also the like, look, I, I'm not a sexual predator and I have not engaged <laughs> in patterns of I'm, abuse. I'm very, very happy that we have that on mic. Yeah, I'm, I hope that's not a surprise to you, <laughs> but like, I, 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 while I can't empathize with that, but like being a person who is trapped in, by their own creation, patterns of behavior that they've been doing for so long that they don't know how to break them, uh, and seeing your own doom ahead of you if you don't stop this like dangerous thing that you're doing, there, there, there's so much to that character that while I simultaneously judge her and say she's terrible, and 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 not only should she like be canceled, whatever that means, uh, but that she shouldn't be allowed to conduct people. She shouldn't be allowed to be in a position of leadership over, let's say a young children's orchestra. 
like I, I can still empathize with her general humanity, which which is like what is so repulsive and alienating to, I guess, a lot of people about this movie. I'm trying to put my finger exactly on the, I think I, I've said it as much as I possibly can, but like there, I see where you are. And generally, as you say it, like empathizing with her general humanity, that's, that's a thing that I have said before about other people. Um, but for some reason I w was fully unable to click into Lydia at all. Mm. She seems so distant and so almost inhuman the only bit of humanity that I really get from her is her interactions with Petra, with her daughter. And, and then she turns around and threatens another child. So it's like, okay, you like your progeny, but not, don't have any respect for anyone else's. It was a tough watch. I think that I would like to watch it again because there, there are some parts that I, I would like to re-examine. But after that, I don't know how much replay value this one has. It's it's kind of an unpleasant experience. I it's interesting. I so the first time I saw it, I found it stressful, uh, especially and the the movie has this accelerating pace where like it increasingly verges into almost montage, like that it speeds up so much as as you know the as the exposure happens. And as, as Lydia's crimes are starting to be revealed on this like massive scale um, and it, it speeds up and we kind of like slip faster and faster through the sequence of events. And I, I found it really stressful. I found myself laying like, Oh my God, Lydia, stop, just stop, just stop it. Can you just, <laughs> why are you saying that? Yep. Why are you bringing her with you on the plane? You are mid like sex abuse scandal and you're bringing your new victim with you to go not only to your book signing, but also to your deposition. What are you like? I, it, I, I found it very stressful. And the, the second viewing kind of knowing where it was going, uh, you know, a, a lot of the stress went away and I was just able to enjoy the extraordinary craft of it. Like the, the photography is staggering. All of the performances top to bottom are incredible. Um, the, the sound design, the sound design is fucking unreal, especially like in her, I mean, the, the conducting scenes in particular, like the, the dynamics when she's conducting and the, the way that we like feel the orchestra all around us, I, I think is really, really incredible. Uh, or, or even the handful of like sort of hallucination scenes where, where she's hearing things. She wakes up several times in the middle of the night yeah, and she hears the, the metronome or the, the, or the, the refrigerator. refrigerator running. Yep. I, as a person, I emphasize with that because sometimes I'll hear the goddamn fridge running or whatever. And I'll go running around trying to figure out what this annoying, terrible sound is. It's a, it's a monumental movie for something that is so small and intimate and like, has a relatively small cast and is mostly about this one character. It is epic in a way that I, I can't entirely explain, but there, there is something in the way that the thing is mounted and framed that just feels enormous to me. Uh, I, I could easily see watching it several more times. Yeah. I mean, it's good. Uh, I think you're right that if this isn't uh, a best picture nominee, that's, that would be kind of insane. And it would be a, a funny way to look back on this episode. Yeah. Oh, but, but that's, I, I say that not because the movie's so good that it is inevitable. Cause that, that's not the thing. It's that it has the, the awards prognosticators, you know, it, it is inevitable that it will get a best picture nomination. It's won a bunch of the critic awards and the BAFTA award nominations just came out, I think today. Uh, and I got a couple there and it's just like all signs are pointing towards like statistically, it would be very unlikely for it to have won all of these things leading up to now for it to then not get a best picture. No, it's, it's not about its quality, you know, don't you want it to be about its quality though? No, because then that would validate the Oscars even more than they already are. Because <laughs> it, it, it's not about quality. Like sure. Tar, Tar was my number one movie of last year, but like my number two movie of last year, uh, is, uh, this tiny little independent movie that A24 put out uh, called After Sun that is beautiful. And like After Sun, maybe, maybe Paul Mezcal will get a Best Actor nomination, but not super likely. His last name is the movie Mezcal? Was with an S, not with a Z. Well, it should be with a Z. Okay, but it's not. 
Um, and I think he's Scottish. Uh, <laughs> so it was never going to be spelled with a Z. Uh, well, now or at I, least he's a Scotsman in the movie. Now I want to drink some Mezcal. Uh, no, you should watch After Sun, which is stunning and will like knock you on your ass. Um, well, then why like, haven't, haven't you talked not... to me about it before? Well, one, because we haven't done the podcast in a while, I rely Jamie, on you and for as these I have canonically established for the audience, we don't talk unless we're recording. And two, I only just saw it a couple weeks ago. I finally caught up with it. Although my local art house theater is finally opening it, and I might go see it again on the real big screen. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know, Jamie, as, as far as all of your, all of your, you know, woke critiques of tar, I, I just, I have, I have one thing to say to you and it's, it's, I'm quoting a, a, a great woman and a powerful conductor. And it's that don't be so eager to be offended, Jamie. Go f*** yourself. The narcissism of small differences leads to the most boring kind of conformity. Yeah, you're, you're not wrong about that. And I actually, that was the one moment uh, as she was being mean to this poor student, I was like, I kind of agree with her argument here that classics are classics for a reason. And it's problematic that they've all been straight white men, but they sh should maybe be engaged with because they are of superlative quality sometimes. No, I, I feel exactly the same way about you, which is that what she's trying to convey to the class in that Juilliard scene is on paper. It, it's hard to, it's hard for me to disagree with. I, I feel like the, 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 the way that we discuss representation and who's been afforded opportunities. And in particular, those ways and the reductive ways that those conversations happen on social media uh, is, is, yeah, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Like, you know, it, you can, do we cancel Bach 150 years later? Like, <laughs> and what does that gain for the music world? But then Lydia is not the best messenger, uh, for that particular message because we find out later, oh, looks like maybe she was protesting a little bit too much. Uh, and also that she does it while being a horrible fucking bully to that poor student. Yeah, she sing she doesn't make the argument to the whole class. She singles him out. Uh it's oh god, it's it's vicious. While she was doing it, I'm like your message is received on my end cuz I've made this argument before about like the classic wines and you know why benchmarks are benchmarks and yes, it's difficult that they're uh that they're all made by white men and consumed by white men and super expensive and whatever, but like oh my god, you're doing it at this poor kid who is who doesn't deserve this kind of shabby treatment. Yeah, she she's using him as a straw man for all of her beefs with like the younger generations and the ways that they are treating the classics. A and like it it's it's this recurring theme throughout the movie that especially on a second viewing it really crystallizes. But like we we get in that New Yorker talk which basically spells out the entire movie for you. Like you should watch it again just for to, to see the way that everything is foreshadowed uh, and also for the ghosts. Um, but the, like there, there's mentions in the New Yorker talk about, I, I think it was Mahler and about the marriage and that Mahler's wife was also a conductor, but agreed to like sublimate her career for the benefit of his. And that maybe Mahler was actually an asshole. And then like that just ends up paralleling Lydia and uh, Sharon's relationship in the way that like, Sharon's career ambitions in the orchestra ended up getting sidelined to teach Lydia the politics so that Lydia could become the head composer uh, and the host composer um, and t tons of other little parallels, all of which are just laid out very organically in that New Yorker scene, which really just feels like a ton of table setting and it and and exposition. And it's all extremely important. We We find out that Lydia started. Uh, I'm on a first name basis with her. Her name is Lydia. Her name is Linda Scott. Jamie! <laughs> Linda Tarr with no accent and two R's. And and two R's. But it, we she we find out in that in that opening New Yorker thing that Lydia started uh doing ethnographic music studies. Uh and that she went into I forgot about that. And that made me feel icky in that moment too. Like she see that that th that's not even the icky part for me. It it's that she is so eager to abandon all of it, right? She starts out doing ethnographic music work and conducting 
rearrangements of indigenous compositions and and non-white composers from the Southern Hemisphere. And she starts out with her accordion foundation or the accordion fellowship that is meant to elevate women composers. And then in the very next scene, when she's sitting there with Mark Strong having this like very passive aggressive lunch with him, she's like, you know what, maybe why, why don't we just drop the whole like gender requirement? Like we, we don't even need it anymore. There, there's no more barriers to women because she has achieved the peak and she has climbed the top of the mountain uh, by playing the same game that all the men did. That now, now she thinks that they don't need those things anymore. It's like now that she she benefited from, I, I don't know. I don't even know if there were systems in place to benefit a young woman to come up, but like she helped create certain systems to kind of change the landscape. And now that she's at the top, she just wants to play Mahler and talk about Bach, and she doesn't want to elevate women unless they're willing to sleep with her. Ugh, it's gross. It's so gross. Hey, hey, Jamie. What? Unfortunately, the architect of your soul appears to be social media. Okay. Fuck you. There, there's some good cutting lines. There, in there really are. I mean, she a real asshole, but that woman can burn people. I mean, she she is at the the top of the intellectual mountain or whatever. She's fucking. She's obviously brilliant. She's not just there because of accordion. She's also. Right an incredibly accomplished mu musician and a genius in a number of ways. So of course she can fucking cut you down. Uh, what was I going to say? Um, oh, the ghosts. I've made a few allusions to it, but you, you haven't taken the bait. Do you have any idea what I'm talking about? I really don't. Because I, I missed it my first viewing, and it was only when I read something in, in some review that makes mention of it that I became super conscious of it. So what, uh, what, what's the dealio? Krista. Krista's ghost appears multiple times in the movie. Really? Yeah. So in so in the New Yorker thing, there we we see some of it. Uh, there's like two shots that are shot behind, like the head of uh, what we presume is like a young woman with very red hair, right? Uh, and that's like a point of view. And then we see that character in the next scene or a couple scenes later when Lydia is in her hotel room in New York. Uh, and we see that woman standing outside as Francesca is coming into the hotel. And then we don't see it for a while. And then in the first scene in Lydia's apartment, her like secret apartment for rehearsing, but also for like where she fucking, you know, does all of her dirty deeds, briefly glimpsed, framed, half cut off through a doorway, sort of out of focus in the distance of a shot is a young woman with bright red hair. Huh. And then we see that same silhouette Later on during, I think it's when Lydia goes to look for the, like the, the phantom metronome. Uh, and it's then established that Krista killed herself a few days prior to that. So like, it's literally her ghost is visualized in the movie as haunting Lydia. And the very first thing that we see in the movie is this, like the, the somebody, I, I guess we presume that it's either either Krista or maybe Francesca, somebody is recording Lydia on a smartphone and overlaid over top of the video is a text exchange talking about her. We see that a couple of times. Uh, and they some kind of comment about, is she with you? No, she's with S. Are you still in love with her? Uh, but prior to that, they're like, oh, maybe she has a conscience. And one of the texts is, no, she's haunted. Oh, wow. So like it's she is literally haunted over the course of the movie. And I didn't notice it through the first viewing. And then knowing to look for it the second time, it scared the shit out of me. All right. I got to take another look at this thing. You should you should watch. You should watch Tara. But it's unpleasant, and Scott. I, I don't I didn't find it that unpleasant. I don't I don't know. It, it would be it would be. Un, I mean, I don't know. It's not a joyous watching experience. It's not. It's very much not. I'm not saying that I didn't like it. It's just. It's not, it's not fun to watch. No, not everything needs to be fun. But that's, you've given me plenty of wines that aren't fun. Those are the things that I like to repeatedly watch is my point. You know, I'm, okay. I'm glad that I saw Tar. I'm not shitting on it. I'm just saying like a repeat viewing is, you know, okay, I'm going to sit down for two hours and 40 minutes and it's going to be kind of unpleasant. But, but it's, but it's good, but it's so good. And I know Scott. I'm not asking you to watch like Schindler's List again, okay, Jamie? I'm <laughs> I'm saying you should watch like a great drama, which blessedly leaves most of the abuses and horribleness off camera. Most. But it definitely most. references them all. Right. And then she does assault Mark Strong at the podium. That was fucking brutal. 
Yeah, there are apparently some online reads of the movie that think that like basically everything after the scene where she she trips and falls and fucks up her face that everything after that is like a hallucination or a dream, which is like, there is no absolutely not textual evidence for that whatsoever. And like would miss the point of everything if it was like some kind of fever dream or hallucination. Uh, but th- that is the one moment where like it, it doesn't break the reality, but it's like, this is an extreme bit of behavior, but maybe it's just an extreme bit of behavior that she's been doing shit like this for a while. And we've just never seen it before. Yeah, I mean, how much of a leap is it for a sexual predator to become to physically assault somebody? It's tar. Tar. It's real good. It's tar. Fucking Linda. So, I, you're you're not keyed into this stuff at all, unless I've mentioned it. You probably have have no idea. So, film Twitter, uh, of which I am more an observer than a participant. Yes, has decided that Lydia Tar is a real person and not a fictional person. Okay. And part of this spun out of an article from, I don't know, some, some person, I, I forget what the outlet was, but there, there was some piece that was published that was mad at the movie for platforming Lydia Tarr and like for trying to humanize her despite all of her crimes and shit. And like, pe- you couldn't entirely tell if the person was being facetious to make a point or if they actually thought that it's based on a real person. Okay. Which it is not. But I, I think in part just because the character is so well realized and in part in like ironic response to that piece that just like film Twitter has embraced Lydia Tarr as a real person. Uh, I, I follow and am followed by an account that's at real Lydia Tarr that continues to like tweet things about the awards race and things like, I don't know Gerard Carmichael uh, and I've never attended the Golden Globes before. Like shit like that based on whatever's <laughs> going on in pop culture at the moment. Uh, very, very fun account there. There's this obsession about all the details. Like there was a great New Yorker piece last week profiling, uh, Todd field, the writer it's Michael Schulman is obsessed with getting to the bottom of this mystery that has plagued film Twitter, which is what did she get her EGOT for? What's the Emmy for the Grammy, the Oscar Tony, we got to know all the things that Lydia did. And so like sprinkled out throughout this long New Yorker profile, it's just like a series of questions. And Field being super coy because he has it all written down in like his biography of the character, but he doesn't actually want to disclose. So there, there's all of that funness. Uh, but then, but then we we danced around it in the beginning, and now I got to ask you, Jamie. So Lydia Tarr, the real person, what does she drink? Well, so uh, what's the what's the character's name? Her her rich benefactor with whom she has a very passive aggressive lunch. That is, oh shit, he's played by Mark Strong in yet another terrible wig for Mark Strong. He, <laughs> he's Elliot Kaplan. Elliot Kaplan. And it's the Kaplan fund that is like financing a lot of her shit. Right. Um, so Elliot Kaplan, uh, it seems, orders a very expensive bottle of white burgundy. Um, I, I could, that, that was white burgundy? That's, that's what it looked like to me, the style of the label. I couldn't like get a beat on a producer or anything, but- um, you know, based on his idea that it is a celebratory bottle and the fanciness of the restaurant that they're in, um, you know, it, it looks to me like white burgundy. But which Lydia declines. She declines because she has to be sharp for, for her class or whatever. So she has God, to can be, you sh- imagine she has to how be sharp bad to take that down. Juilliard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how horrible would that have been if, if she had like two glasses? In? <laughs> so much worse. She would have just come out swinging right away. Immediately. Like, you little shit, how dare you? No, I mean she would have hit him. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, probably. Anyway, my supposition is that uh, Mr. Kaplan knows what she drinks, and she likes white burgundy. Uh... It tracks, right? She's a person who appreciates classics. Things that are are well-established, that are well-known to be performers. Uh, and white burgundy or burgundy in general is like the ultimate, um, that or really champagne or Bordeaux. But the, these are the things that uphold the, like the standards to which we hold wine in general. They're the, they're the box and the Beethoven's and the Mahler's of, of the wine world. Right. Um, and burgundy being the more subtle of the three, the, the lighter, um, you know, maybe, maybe leaning in the Bach direction over the Beethoven direction, 
Uh, I think that she would particularly enjoy white burgundy. If she was at a bar, though, I mean, prob- probably a, a martini, a classic ass gin martini. Hmm. Um, once again, you know, a, a classy, simple, um, you know, th- this is what it is type of expression. It's interesting. Now, what does Linda Tarr order at the bar? Because the, the, the reveal late in the game that, like, and there, there have been allusions or, like, hints throughout that she's a fraud. Um, but especially watching it a second time, you see so many more of them. Uh, like, the way that she implies that Leonard Bernstein was her mentor – which even Todd Field, the writer-director, admitted as though it was a question in the same way that like fans talk about this stuff, where he's like, there's no way that's possibly true, right? Like Bernstein died in 91. Like how, how, how could she possibly have, have studied with him? But like so there's the bit early when she's in the hotel and she's listening to NPR uh, and we hear like the NPR like ad break and you think she's like mocking the voice of the person like this is NPR. And I kind of wonder if it's her practicing the perfect like cultured East Coast accent. Oh man, yeah, I think that that's right. Even even IndieWire film critic uh, David Ehrlich pointed out uh, that Lydia Tarr ultimately revealed to be like from Long Island uh, is is the presumption based on how expensive her cab ride was to get to the like suburban, like outer boroughs, New York area where her parents' home is. Uh, her wearing a New York Rangers cap uh, is just like a f- yet another layer of her deception about like what place she has in culture that she's a New Yorker. She's not from the borough. She's not from Long Island. Uh, but so what? So what does what does Linda order? Does Linda get like? I mean, if if she was a Philly person, she'd get like a Philly wide, right? Or like that's yeah, a, shot, a, a city shot, wide, a shot and a beer. Um, and I'm I'm thinking something similar, but I don't know. She's such a not no nonsense person, or at least wants to present that. Um, that even even in her like native land, so to speak, she might not even go to the length of drinking a beer. She might just have a bourbon, um, you know. So kind of the way friend of the pod drinks, just like I, I was. We have we have to bleep him, but I was just going to say, I I imagine her if she's being honest, if she's letting her hair down, it's it's a glass of vodka. Yeah, the, you're, that's probably a better one than bourbon. Just yeah. just vodka, straight to the point. We don't need to talk about, you know, flavor here. This is for this is for me to get drunk. Uh yeah, Lin, Linda's a, a vodka drinker. Maybe at at best a vodka soda. Mm. But more likely just like vodka on the rocks. But certainly as as Lydia, she she drinks gin and and Chardonnay from Burgundy. Yeah, do you do you have anything else? Do you have anything else to say about the tar? I feel like I feel like I said all that I wanted to say. Yeah, I'm 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 good on it. And we've already talked pairing. Yeah. Uh, I think I think it's a good contrapuntal pairing. You you disagree. You think it's either a before or after kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, like we've been recording almost two hours and I'm already sick of this wine. And like there's still fifty minutes left of tar at this point. <laughs> Yeah, tar, tar is not a short one, and it, I don't want to say that it um, it doesn't crawl. It doesn't like I'm not checking my watch, but it makes you feel every minute. I, I mean, I, I that's that's your experience of it. I can't I can't dispute your experience. It's not short, but I find it so incredibly captivating that I have no problem with the length. You know, I would sooner watch Tar again than I would watch like another two and a half hour Marvel movie. But that's that's also just my taste, and I feel like every minute of those sometimes. Well, I would I, w- I would agree with you on that one. Even even yeah. with my aversion to wanting to like watching Tar again, I still don't want to watch a two and a half hour Marvel movie. Yeah, so I I don't I don't feel that it's it's long. We we've talked about this before. I don't think that there's such a thing as too long. I mean, there, there, and I didn't say that this was too long. I just right, said it. You but, feel it. Or I felt I, it. Well, maybe that's part of the epic thing that I'm probably mischaracterizing. But it, it, there, there's a scale to it, and that's where the depth comes in. You know? Yeah. If this, like, there's not a ton of plot. You could tell this story in ninety. minutes. I was about to say it, that there's it a cut. Wouldn't work. There's a ninety minute cut, but it doesn't do what this movie does. Right. It t- which is make a fully realized empathetic monster. A fully realized monster. Let me. All right, we 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 can drop this, but here's the last thing. 
I empathize with her. I do not sympathize with her. Yeah, I'll, I'll, that's fine. Yeah. I neither sympathize nor empathize. Well, she's terrible. Jamie, fucking get off of social media, you, you fucking millennial tool. I, I will not be doing that. No. I will continue to wear my millennial tool pin proudly. I'm going to make you a fucking t shirt that, that just says millennial tool. No, no, no. That says, I'm an ultrasonic epistemic dissident. I would wear the shit out of that t-shirt. And then on the back, it says, the architect of my soul is social media. That, that one's even better. It's really good. There, there's, there's some sick burns in there. And she's just fucking vicious. And this is a, just, he's a kid. Yeah. He's just trying to express himself. Yeah. Rather, they yeah. are just trying to express themselves. Right. Yeah. He does. Or they, they do describe as, as pangenesis. Yes. Uh, uh, all right. Well, we could, we could talk about Tar until the cows come home and Lydia punches them in the face. It's, but and it's instead, likely we'll do bits off mic, you know, ad infinitum forever and ever. I, I think about this character all the time. Like truly she has taken up like rent in, in my head. That is and she's just living there. Uh, she, she's just such a complete and complexing character. I can't like. She, she's always there. And it doesn't help that, you know, like she's in the room with me right now. <laughs> she's just standing over there like the ghost of her poor. Because your wife is fucking demented. It's really funny. It's very good. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's it for Tar. If you're still listening and you haven't seen Tar, the hell are you doing? Go out and watch Tar. And sorry for all the spoilers, but we warned you. Uh, and uh, yeah, we've we've got more to come. Uh, Jamie, what wine are we doing next time? It doesn't really matter from my side of things. So next, we're going to go with um, Laurent Barth Alsace Extra Brut Petiant Naturel. Uh, a pet nat, if you will, from mm. Alsace in France. Um, it is a field grape of or a field blend of grapes uh, from that region. This is another wine that I'm kind of going in blind on based on reputation. I've had some of the still wines of Laurent Barth, but this is their their pet net bottling, um, and I'm excited to drink it. It is also available at chamberstreetwines.com. Uh, this one will run you $24.99 plus tax and shipping. All right. And uh, for movie side of things, the again, as of this recording, Oscar noms have not yet dropped. They drop five days from now. Uh, but if you're trying to play along at home and you want to do some catch up, uh, you, you, there, there's some things you should watch, uh, in the realm of extremely high likelihood of a best picture nomination, things we will be discussing. Uh, there's everything everywhere all at once. Yes. The aforementioned The Fablemans, uh, The Banshees of Inna Sheeran. In the medium to high likelihood, you got your Top Gun Maverick, your Avatar The Way of Water. Surging in the race is apparently the Netflix original All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, fucking the Baz Luhrmann Elvis might secure... A Best Picture nom, which I'm dreading watching again. I didn't want to have to watch that at all. Well, I don't know. You might like it. I don't know. You might like it. You might like it. Lots of people like it. Uh, and and then there there's others, a varying degree of likelihood, like Triangle of Sadness, Women Talking, Nope, The Woman King, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, and increasingly unlikely is Babylon or Glass Onion. Uh, but th those are the things that maybe you should watch to play along. But of course, by the time you listen to this episode, the nominations will already be out. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jamie just needs to start watching all of those. Yep, I've got to, I've got to get ahead because I am very behind. Well, you've seen everything everywhere. And I've seen and nope. you've seen Top Gun, and Top Gun, and you've seen and Nope, and you've seen Avatar. You haven't seen Fablemans. Have not. I have not seen All Quiet on the Western Front. That's the only one I haven't seen. Uh, you haven't seen Elvis. You haven't nope. seen Triangle of Sadness, right? I have not. That's an extremely Jamie movie. You'll fucking love that in all the ways that you don't like Tar. I'm excited for it. Well, because just that movie is like, it's just, it's fucking catnip for you. <sighs> anyway. So anyway. Yeah, next time on. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Please follow us on the socials at Bigger Bottle Pod. Be sure to email us with comments, questions, concerns at biggerbottlepod at gmail.com. Make sure you rate, review, and follow the show wherever you get your podcasts. If you are a listener outside the U.S. and you leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, be sure to email it to us as well so that we can read it on the air. Apple only shows us domestic reviews. This episode was produced and edited by me, that's Scott Hudson, and our social media presence is thanks to Jamie Harrison Rubin. That is him. 
Our art is the fine work of Ross Connor. Thank you so much, Ross. Remember, everyone, drink more wine and watch more movies. It's good for you. We promise. Hang on, let me see if I have one more caustic tar quote that I can throw at you. Oh, boy. I'm really excited for it. Apartment for sale. Apartment for sale. (laughs) Your mother's buried deep, and now you're going to keep her apartment for sale. Your sister's in jail. You put your sister in jail. You're all going to hell. Your apartment's for sale. (laughs) It's so good. It's so good. She's fucking awful. She's horrendous. She's my friend. I like her. Wouldn't want to hang out with her, though. Not even a little bit. No. All right, we're done. I'm hitting the button. Hitting that button.